I'm hot. I think it doesn't show enough. It's Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining with us today and to discuss this really important topic. There would hardly be a family amongst us that haven't been touched by cancer in some way. And as October is Breast Cancer Awareness Week, here at the Mums at the Table, we want to take this opportunity to not only raise awareness about this disease and its impact on, our, on the mums in our community, but we wanted to help raise some money for this really important um, topic. We want to help with the research because we know the research is where we're getting the improvements for, for the mums. Now, let's say take the village to raise a child. We have a Facebook group for mums at the table. And if you're a mum and would like to get some support around all things parenting, we'd encourage you to join that. There are a lot of mums in our community. We have about 9,500 mums that are asking all kinds of parenting questions about sleeping, feeding, um, raising teenagers. And if you're a mum who's been on that journey for a while too, it would be great for you to join us and um, add some of your wisdom from your years of experience. So today we're going to be talking, first of all, to Dr. Sandra Krishnan. She's a breast surgeon from the Sydney Adventist Hospital. And we're also going to be talking to a couple of inspiring women who've already been on this journey and have come through on the other side. So grab your cuppa, I've got mine. Find a comfy couch, sit back, and listen to what we've got to talk to about today. But most importantly, if you are able, it would be great if you could donate to this cause, Pink Ribbon Breast Cancer Awareness Cause. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more as we go through the program. But first, have a look as we talk to Gina, as Gina talks to Dr. Kristen about the three signs of breast cancer that you should never ignore. Three signs of breast cancer you should never ignore. I'm here with breast surgeon Dr Krishnan. She's here from the SAM. Hi, Dr Krishnan. Hi, Gia. Thank you for coming today. This is such an important topic. Um, in your opinion, what are the first, like the main three signs that we should never ignore? Well, Gia, the first, which I think everybody knows, is a lump in the breast. Yes. Definitely. If you feel something and you can call it a lump, a mass, a nodule, then that's something you really have to watch out for. Yes. The second thing would be nipple discharge. And the third thing I would put in the list would be skin changes. Skin changes, okay. Yeah. Now keep in mind, Gia, that there are others too, um, redness of the breast, even um, sore, the breast being sore. Okay. Um, that's an important sign as well. So I would actually make it really easy 
any changes, yes. get help. Get help. That's yeah. a good point. So what if someone's not seeing any changes or symptoms? Like, what, what do you suggest? That's a very important question because that's where breast screen comes in, yeah. screening. So we screen women who are asymptomatic. They are absolutely fine. Yes. And we invite them to come and do an X-ray of the breast. Yes. And when they do that, then we can, you know, um, detect abnormalities. And if there is something, then there's a call back. So they come back for more images and perhaps biopsies, and we take it from there. Wow. Okay. And so how old are these women that um, go for screening? So how do you know when to go for screening, I guess? Well, on your 50th birthday, you'll get a present in the mail. Oh, great. <laughs> and that's the invitation to breast screen. Right. So you can't miss it. Everyone's on it. Happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> it's so important. Yes. Um, every two years, um, up to the age of 74, and beyond if there are any issues. Yes. And what about someone like me that has a lot of family history of breast cancer? Well, someone under the age of 50, let's say 40 to 50, you can still present for um, screening mammograms. Yes. And that depends on your personal risk. Right. So the most important thing is to be totally breast aware. Yes. Family history aware for each and individual person. And then you can present. Someone younger than 40 can also see their GP yes. if they felt that there was something wrong. Perfect. Thank you, Dr Krishnan. So that's the top three to remember is breast lumps, Lump. yes. breast discharge, nipple discharge, is that right? Absolutely. And changes in the skin. That's our top three to, to really never, ever... Um, Forget. Forget, yes, absolutely. We'll see you next time, hopefully, Dr Krishnan. And if you guys want some more of these wonderful topics we're talking about, please go to mumsatthetable.com and we'll see you next time. We're about to be joined by Dr. Chris Nan, who's going to talk to us about some of the um, other things that we need to look for. Hi, Dr. Chris Nan, how are you? Thanks for joining us I'm today. I'm really good, Julie. Thank you for having me. What a wonderful way to finish off October. Breast Cancer Awareness. Yes. Yep, we're nearly at the end. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, in your video where you were talking to Gia, you were talking a lot about mammograms and that's something that affects women over 40, over 50 and possibly over 40. But I'd like to focus a little bit, I think, on the impacts of cancer in younger women. And it's something, you know, when we're a mum, we get really busy doing all the mum things. Yeah. We tend to put our um, health on the back burner and think yeah. about our mums and our husbands. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because I have the impression, and you can, you let me know if I'm wrong, that cancer, breast cancer can actually be more aggressive in a younger woman. Is that correct? Well, absolutely, Julie. Although the uh, incidence is lower in a younger woman, it tends to occur in the older woman. But when it does happen, it tends to be larger. It tends to be more aggressive. And... Uh, because they don't present for screening the way the older woman does, it tends to be at an advanced stage. So you are right. Um, in fact, I would say breast cancer in a younger woman is a whole different entity. Okay, so can you talk us through that? How should mum, what should mums watch out for? How can they try and minimise their um, risk of being diagnosed at a later stage because they're just busy doing other things? What should they be doing? Well, it's really interesting. I was asking my daughter the other day, who's 21, I said, Anna, are you aware of your breast cancer risk? And she said, I have no idea. So oh, if your daughter's not, what about the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think doing what you're doing, what we're doing, which is talking about it, being really aware of, of your, your own health, your family history, and um, what your risk is in terms of what you can't change. So if you have many relatives on one side with breast cancer or even ovarian cancer, then you can't change that risk. And um, another thing to do would be to modify some risk factors that we can, so some lifestyle factors. And uh, I guess the most important thing would be to be breast aware, so to check your own breasts 
once a month, every month, just like paying your bills and doing everything we do once a month, getting our periods, we do this check and get help if you find something. Um, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about self-examination in a moment and you've told me that you're able to help us through that because we hear self-examination but like, what does that exactly mean? Just one quick question before we go on to that. Does it matter what time of the monthly cycle that is done? Because I know that it can, different things can happen to your breasts at different times of your monthly cycle. Absolutely, Julie. So we want to do it smack in the ovulation time, which is about two weeks before or two weeks after. Right. There's a, there's a reason for that because during, during one period, the breasts are enlarged, engorged, tender, painful. So it's just not the right time. Whereas if you go in between your monthly cycle, that's, that's the time to know what your breasts feel like normally. And we're trying to do this not to create anxiety, but no, just to know what's normal. Mm. You can detect yes, we've had, sorry, yes, we've had the question come up in our group. I found a lump. I'm a mum. Yes, I'm going to see the doctor. Has this happened to any other mum? And we've had so many responses from the mums all saying yes, but it was a cyst. It was a blocked milk duct. It was anything but cancer. But at the same time, we cannot ignore it either. I know when I was a young mum, I went through that process, got a head lump. My 28-year-old daughter has been the process, been through that process. So we really want to encourage mums to, yes, if they find something, go and check, but be not too worried about it. Absolutely, Julie. The predominant cause of a mass uh, is a benign cause, like you say, assist. Um, a, a lump that's that's not cancerous at all. That's the predominant thing. Um, I felt one too when I was working at the Breast Cancer Institute. Um, I was examining so many women and dealing with cancer so much that I felt, gosh, I have a lump, and I went through the whole thing, and it was all there was nothing there. But um, it's important to do the check because yeah. if you find it, and if you find it really early, that makes all the difference. Can you talk to us about how um, is the best way to examine our own breasts so that we can catch these things early? Happy to. So I've got a little prop. Yay. <laughs> a little prop here. Um, before, before we examine the breast proper, you want to take off all your clothes, of course, look at yourself in the mirror, front and side, and with your arms in the air, by the side, just making sure everything looks the same. And then you go on to examine the breast per se. So I'll show you on this model here. Just on looking, you can already see the differences. Now, in that video, I talked about a mass or a lump, and I talked about nipple discharge, but I'll qualify that a little bit and say any nipple change. So this model, I can actually, I don't know if you can see that, but I can pull that in, and you can see how there's a bit of a retraction there. So the nipple being pulled inward, that's a sign of, of, of something wrong that needs to be checked. And once you've had a look, everything looks okay, then you can check either all around, from out to in or in to out. You can go up and down. Let me try and get that. Up and down. Yep. Or like the pages of a book. And you're always using the three pads of your finger to check. And once you're done with the breast, don't forget the underarms, the armpit, and the other side as well. So that's a full breast exam. Initially, it feels really weird. Everything feels like a lump, perhaps. But doing it monthly is when you really get a lay of the land and you know what your body is meant to feel like and look like. So if you did find something, you would go straight to your GP, I'm guessing, make an appointment. And then the GP would send you off for further tests. Is that the process? Yes, Julie. So I try and teach my patients about the triple test. Triple test is the first part of a test is a, an examination by your doctor. So your doctor examines you, feels the lump or not, and then sends you for imaging. Now, for a younger woman, like you mentioned, it might be an ultrasound, not a mammogram first. Might still be followed by a mammogram and might still need further imaging. And finally, if there is something, that's when we need a biopsy, so a needle test. And those, those three things 
in examination, the imaging and biopsy. That, those three things are the triple test. It, it's a must to check. And then you can give yourself a tip, may I have nothing, yep. or let's do something. So in your experience, what has been the main reason why women fail to follow through on doing these tests, having their mammograms? You know, we know we do it, but what are, what are the excuses that you hear most often or why do women put off these kinds of things? You know, uh, Julie, when I, was, when I was a younger breast surgeon and I, and I tried to convince a lady to go for her mammogram, keep in mind I was way before the time for mammogram for myself, she was not happy. She said, you have no idea how painful it is. And just, she was not happy with me. And, and I liken it something, I liken it to colonoscopies and the bowel prep, you know. Those of us who haven't done it may not feel the pain of those who have. So yes, yeah. what I'm trying to do is pain, the perception of uh, pain, Whereas now it's not as painful as it used to be, but it's still an uncomfortable exam. The second I think it's fear. Just I don't even want to know, you know? And that's quite normal. Who wants to give up their time and all that effort to go through the triple test even? Yeah. Yeah. It's putting me off. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right when you said there's the fear of pain for a lot of women. And I think in some ways it's the fear of the unknown amount of pain. Yes. And yes. and can I, can I say from my own experience that the fear of the unknown pain is much worse than the actual pain. You know, it yes. really wasn't as bad as I was expecting. And once you've done it the first time, it seemed to just be less intimidating, you know, the, the following times. So, yeah, mums, we really want to encourage you to, do self-examination, get those mammograms once you get to that stage because it is so, so important to stay on top of these things. Dr Krishnan, thank you so much for joining us today. We know you're really busy and we really appreciate your expertise in joining us. Absolutely, um, Julie. Thank you. You're welcome. Now we're going to look at another video that you did with um, Gia, and it's three things that you can do to reduce your risk factor to um, get breast cancer in the first place. Yes. See you later, Julie. Bye. So we're three moving on to the next change now to reduce. You're moving on to the next video now, um, where Gia is talking to Dr. Christian about three things you can do to reduce your risk. Three things you can change now to reduce your risk of breast cancer. We are here today with breast surgeon, Dr. Krishnan. She's here from the SAN. Hi, Dr. Krishnan. Hi, Gia. Thank you for coming today. These are such important topics. And I wanted to ask, yeah, what are these three things we can do right now to change our risk? Really good question, Gia. The first is alcohol. Wow, alcohol. Reducing your alcohol intake. So... One drink a day, up to seven a week. Um, alcohol is linked with many, many cancers and uh, breast cancer is just one of them. The risk, lifestyle risk factor number two would be obesity or being overweight. So you want to maintain an ideal body weight. And number three is linked to number two, regular exercise. Okay. To maintain that body weight and no binge drinking. No Those binge, would be the yes. three things to do that you can today. do yourself, that you're in control. So what about the things we're not in control of, so the, the risk factors? Well, one would be the oestrogen window. So someone who, has, uh, who, who, ha who had their periods early yep. or they have late menopause, so they have a longer oestrogen window, that tends to lead, with, that tends to, lead to higher risk yes. of getting breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Past history of breast disease or breast cancer. In the family. And, oh, of on course, some, some, on yourself. Yeah. And, and, of course, cancer in the family, breast cancer in the family. Mm -hmm. And um, mapping out the family tree is very important because we look at which side the cancer is on. And even paternal, your father's breast cancer can affect you. Wow, okay. And if there's a very strong family history, then you might go for a family cancer clinic um, and test your genes. So tell us a little bit more about the genetics. Well, thankfully, a very small number, only 5% perhaps, 
of uh, breast cancers are due to a mutated gene. And you would have heard of BRCA1 and 2. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> They're the a lot of people do, yeah. Everyone knows about BRCA1 and 2. So they cause an increase in not just breast cancer, but ovarian cancers as well. Wow, OK. So we detect them by checking uh, women's family histories of how many patients, how many patients with breast cancer in their family or ovarian cancer on one side and that tells us of their higher risk. Of their risk. And they then present to a family cancer clinic and uh, based on that discussion, they might get tested. And if they're positive, then options are discussed with them. Is the option um, a, a surveillance, uh, you know, intensive surveillance? Yes. Um, is the option medical treatment or is the option risk-reducing uh, mastectomies. Mm -hmm. So that's a discussion that needs For to be For another had. time, yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank you, Dr Krishnan. It was so nice to talk to you again. What great information we're learning. Please stay tuned for some more of these topics at Mums at the Table. And we want to thank you again for coming today. My pleasure. <laughs> See you next time. You know, sometimes women can have a healthy lifestyle and seem to be doing the right things, but sometimes breast cancer still hits. Now I'm going to be joined by a mum of three and a breast cancer survivor, Tracy Bridcutt. Welcome, Tracy. Thanks for joining us today. Can't hear you, Tracy. I think you might still be on mute. I think that's got it. Thanks, Julie. Nice, to, nice to be with you. So, Tracy, um, 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 yes, look, Julie, I just listening to what um, Dr. Uh, Christenen was saying, um, definitely I was in the probably low risk or no risk um, category. I didn't have a family history. Um, there was no lumps or bumps or skin changes, anything like that. Um, I sort of like to think, or some people would probably think it's a bit of a fluke that it actually was found. I, I kind of think it was um, more of a miracle, to be honest. Um, just a, a little bit of a, the story is that um, I went to the um, my GP for my usual probably yearly or it was probably pushed out to two yearly by that stage checkup. And um, yeah, she usually does a bit of an examination of the breasts. And um, she actually um, thought that uh, she felt something in my right breast. So she um, uh, wrote me a referral to go and get both a, an ultrasound and a mammogram. And so I went off to do that. And um, that the ultrasound wasn't really clear of anything, but the, um, the mammogram um, picked up some cancer cells actually in the left breast. So she, as I said, she thought there was something in the right breast, but actually it was in the left breast that um, some cancer cells were detected. And uh, so began uh, my journey. <laughs> so that would have been a shock to not only you, but your GP. Yeah, look, um, that's right. It was a shock. Um, it was pretty confronting. I, I thought I was leading a, a pretty uh, healthy life, to be honest, uh, working full time. Actually, I was doing two jobs at that stage. Uh, no family history of um, cancer, um, breast cancer. Uh, so, yeah, it kind of blew me away a bit. So you're so a mum of three. three. I, think I think they, they were, were in primary, primary school, school, school at that time, time weren't they? So they're so quite little. little. You know, you know, I think it goes through our heads, heads all the time as mums, mums how, how we would approach we would these things if we're in those circumstances. circumstances. So, so how did you, how you deal with that in telling, telling, first of all, your children, maybe your husband, maybe your extended family and friends? Yeah, well, look, the timing, I mean, it's never a great time to get cancer but um, the timing for me I was diagnosed exactly one week before Christmas um, so um, yeah it was it was pretty pretty dreadful um, it all meant that everything also had to be delayed they couldn't do anything till January and blah 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 um, so look um, the long and the short of it was I guess I didn't want to um, spoil Christmas for 
anybody, let alone the children. So I, I, I did tend to keep a lot of it um, sort of internally, obviously told, you know, my parents and, and close friends and whatnot. Um, but um, yeah, I didn't really say a lot to the children at first. Also, so after speaking to my husband, we wanted to, uh, I guess, find out a little bit more about the, the type of cancer, what, what, um, what, what it was, what impact it was going to have. Um, and um, yeah, so that, um, that's where that um, conversation went to. A tough one to have. So, um, what was your treatment like? Yeah, so what I, I had to um, go and have um, some surgery, so what they call a lumpectomy. Um, so that's where they take a, um, a section of um, the breast tissue out. Um, they take a wide enough section so they hope that they've, they've caught it all. Um, and then um, that was um, sent um, sent away for pathology and whatnot, um, and they did um, they did think that they had caught it all, um, but uh, at the same time they uh, wanted to do um, some uh, radiotherapy just to be to be sure that no cancer cells had escaped somehow um, into you know the surrounding um, breasts. So I then had um, six weeks of um, um, yeah, radiotherapy sessions uh, once a day for yeah for five days. That was pretty that was intense. intense. Once a day. Yeah, it was. Was that, uh, was that was process, that process like, like what, what you were expecting, or was it totally different? different? You know, we talked well, we about, about, about the radio, radio, and chemo was a whole other ball game. Ball game. Yeah, look, I really didn't know what to expect. Um, it was all a bit of a blur. I found it quite confronting. Um, you know, you're in this room with this um, large machine hovering over you to give you the dose of um, radiotherapy. Um, you're kind of stuck in this awkward position on this really hard table. Um, you're trying not to move. Um, these thoughts are going through your head like, oh, if I move, what are they going to do? Zap my heart or something, you know, you just, yeah, I did find it quite stressful. Um, I guess you get used to it. Um, but uh, yeah, the first couple of times, um, you know, first week or so it was, yeah, pretty, pretty tough. But then I guess you get into the routine of it. Um, and then, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> So how did you struggle the whole situation of getting on with your life? Um, um, I think you've been working with you, still being a mum, but going to treatments and, you know, those, it's a whole other impact in your life that you have to deal with emotionally. I mean, as a physical level, but still, you know, continue being a mum and a wife and everything, everything else, else that we do. do. Yeah, look, um, fortunately I had um, uh, very good employers. I was still doing sort of two jobs. So um, in both cases, I was able to uh, manage to still keep working and then have the treatment and then go back to work. Um, yeah, I, I work as a journalist, so I was able to, to juggle that. Um, also, um, just the support of um, family and friends um, and, and the school that the children um, were attending at the time, they were really good. They, they um, uh, you know, dropped off meals to our house. Um, and we had, I had a friend who also, you know, came with me to a couple of the um, radiotherapy sessions. Um, just, you know, just that sort of practical support was, was really appreciated. Yeah. I think it's really good to know because while not all of us will get breast cancer, we may know someone who's going on that journey either with breast cancer or cancer itself and just to know what we can do to support those practical support is what people are looking for. So finally, Tracy, what would you say to other women who are being faced with the diagnosis of breast cancer? Well, the first thing I would say is, um, I guess my experience um, sort of backs up the importance of mammograms for early detection. If I hadn't had that mammogram, like I had, as I said, I had no symptoms. So um, the mammogram confirms, you know, that there was something there before um, 
before they even, you know, before it had even sort of grown into a lump or spread or anything like that. So I was, I was very lucky in that regard. Um, for, for women that may be um, going through the experience, I know that they're um, coming up with um, more and more sort of different ways, even since I, I would, I've um, had my treatment, um, you know, better ways to, to do these things and um, better technology and all sorts of things. So um, just to, yeah, look, um, get the support of your family and friends if possible. Um, be easy on yourself. Um, I now also try to take a bit more control of my life and make sure I do the exercise. I do, um, you know, make sure I eat plenty of um, the red berries and, and, and other things just to boost my um, antioxidants because it's always, I guess, in the back of your mind that um, you want to, keep the um keep it possibly at bay make sure it doesn't happen again yeah. we're glad we're you're glad doing, you're so, doing well. so well really glad that you know that's all gone well and your treatment was successful thank you so much for joining us tracy and for telling us your story and giving hope to a lot of women it's julie so next we're going to be joined by shelly shelly is also a breast cancer survivor um, her story is a little bit more recent and quite a different story to Tracy's. Hi, Shelley. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Judy. How are you? I'm well, thank you. So your story is, you've been listening to um, Tracy's story, but yours is very different, isn't it? You were under 50, I think, at the time as well. Um, but how was yours um, picked up? And it was a very different kind of cancer as well, from what I understand. Yeah, totally. So sometimes I feel a bit strange calling myself a survivor because I didn't actually end up with cancer having to have chemo having to have radiotherapy but I had what they call pre-cancer so the DCIS cells and for me I had no symptoms I didn't have any lumps I got tender breasts at the right time of the month so you know there was just nothing that made me think I needed to have a mammogram other than um I was about to turn 47. I'm trying to remember how old I am. How old are you? I was heading into my 47th birthday and my GP, we were just there and, and having a checkup. I hadn't been in such a long time and he was ticking the boxes, I guess. And he said, look, you're, you're coming on to 50. I know you've still got a couple of years, but what would you think about having a mammogram? Just, you know, to have a check and make sure everything's okay. Um, I know, you know, he gave me the number for the breast cancer breast check line to go and call and make an appointment. And I sat on it for a good couple of days because I kind of thought, I'm not 50, there's no history in my family, there's no cancer at all in my family whatsoever. Um, it just felt like, do I really need to do this? And then this little voice just in my head was like, well, what have you got to lose? You know, it's a couple of minutes, you go, they do the test and you'll at least know. So I booked in. And I went and I didn't even think about it. I really didn't. It wasn't, I hadn't really heard horror stories, so I wasn't expecting pain or anything. It did feel a bit like a squashed pancake. That's about it, really. <laughs> and I went home not even thinking twice about it. A week later, I got a letter in the post to say that they'd seen something abnormal. And would I come in to have a, um, what do you call it, biopsy? Yes. So I went off to Westme, the breast clinic there, and I had my biopsy, and that was actually no pain at all whatsoever. It was fine. They took an area. I was about to actually head off on a cruise with the lady I worked for, and um, the Tuesday, I was going off on the Wednesday. The Tuesday, they called me in, and um, they said they found something in the biopsy, and it was... Um, well, they weren't 100% certain, but they thought it was DCIS. And so they wanted to actually, they had noticed on my mammogram that it was quite a widespread area and they wanted to take another biopsy. But they'd like me to meet with the surgeon first and have a chat with him and just talk about the procedure. So they booked that in for the week I came back from the cruise. So I think we arrived on the Tuesday and I was seeing him on the Friday. So, of course, not thinking anything about it. Off I went off to the hospital, didn't even take my husband with me. I thought I'm just talking to a surgeon about a biopsy and I already had one biopsy and that was fine. So 
um, got in there and um, he actually said to me, the area that of your breast, it's about a third of your breast that is covered in these white spots on the mammogram. And we're really worried that if we take a biopsy of a section, we'll miss a section and not realize that you have cancer. So we are suggesting you have a mastectomy and just have all the breast tissue removed. So for me, I didn't have, I had no one there. That must have been so shocking to, from nothing, to yeah. having a mastectomy in one conversation. Totally, yeah. You walked. I walked in thinking I'm having a biopsy and left knowing that I was probably going to have a mastectomy. See, so. this is something I haven't heard. You were, even though you had precancerous cells, they still suggested that you have a biopsy. Yeah, yeah, because... The area was just too too large and they didn't want to go, okay, it's pre-cancer, and then the area next to it wasn't. So they just didn't want yeah. to take the charge. And the biggest issue for them, as they explained it, was um, they could say, yes, it's DCIS, and we take another biopsy and that come back as DCIS. But because of the widespread of it, if I had a mammogram in three years' time, two, five years' time even, those same white spots are going to be there and there's nothing to differentiate it between cancer and not cancer. So there's no way for them to tell, oh, it's changed. Okay, now it's cancer without having yeah. another biopsy every single time. So did you have very long to process all of that before you had the actual um, mastectomy? Um, not really because they asked me to come back the next week <laughs> with a decision. So yeah. it was really just straight onto the phone to my husband. Um, I'm part of a mum's group, so I reached out to all of them and just went, oh, I don't know what to do. I feel a bit like Angelina Jolie. Do I lop it off? And there's nothing wrong, but I'm, you know, I just remember her being very much in the, the newspapers when I was growing yeah. up because she had it done because of her sister's experience, you know, and she got quite a bit of negative press. So it just it makes you think about it. Yeah. So, what was the recovery of that um, like for you? How do you how are you feeling now? How recent was this for you? I don't think we mentioned so, that. No, I didn't. So, I had April second of April was my one year anniversary. Okay, so it's really yeah. quite recent. So, what's that recovery process been like for you, and how are you feeling today? Today, I'm finally feeling me. <laughs> really, but it definitely did take. It took a long time. Um, I mean, you are taking a part of yourself away. Um, for me, it was a big thing, I guess. Being a mom, that was how I fed my kids. Okay, I didn't do such a great job with the first two, but still, it was, you know, it was me. It was how I identified myself. And it was my husband just saying to me, well, I don't care. I love you anyway. Yeah. That made me realize it's just a part of your body, but it is a process you have to come to terms with. And I had, <sighs> thankfully, other friends who had had breast cancer who had had mastectomies and reconstructions so they all talked me through what they had experienced how they felt um there's also different ways of doing it so they said you know research the different ways that can be done um and just just talking to other people about it really does help yeah. do you feel you got the support you needed at the time for sure yeah definitely i mean the the hospital was great they have a psychologist you can go and see if you feel the need, which was awesome. They put you in touch with everyone. Plus just having friends and family. Um, I just happened to belong to an awesome Bible study group, life group, um, two of them. So I've got a women's group and I've just got a, a group of friends and they were just great. They gathered around me, they prayed for me. My late women's group, they all bought me like little gift baskets and it was a daily thing that I could open in the lead up to my operation. Just a little simple gift, like a thing of soaps or a little prayer or a Bible verse or, you know, yeah. just something encouraging. Yeah. So I guess the message from that is be willing to reach out and mm -hmm. ask for support and accept support. Yep. And definitely. I think the other message I've got from both you and Tracy was listen to your doctor. <laughs> um, get your checks, do what you need to do. And give yourself the best possible chance. And and in this day and age, I think you know the ability to treat breast cancer seems to be doing pretty well, a lot better than it was in the past. 
So thanks, no, no, um, exactly. I mean, it was such early detection that I didn't need any of the any of the chemo or the radiation. They've caught it before it even turned. Um, there's the knowledge, like some people go, well, do you feel like you did did it and it was for no reason? No, because once you have DCIS, you're 100% certain at some points in your life it will change. You just don't know when. Thanks so much, Shelley. Your story is inspiring and um, very informative. So we thank you so much for joining us today and all the best. Glad you're doing well and glad that after this time you feel finally feeling like you again. <laughs> Thanks. It is. It's just you get used to it. It's just something you have to work through, but you, you won't work through it on your own. You do need the support network. And like Tracy said, if you if you know someone going through this, um, my husband is the cook in our family. I was the one having the operation, but our friends cooked for us. And I know my older son was like, that's so funny, mom, you don't even cook. Why are they cooking for us? But he appreciated that because that gave him the time to then look after me. Yeah, and know? the space, you know, and everything yeah. else that was needed. Yeah. Little things like that, dropping off little notes, a yep. thing of food, fruit, anything. Yeah. So encouraging. Okay, th thanks, Shelley. Really appreciate your time and everything you've told us today. So, Mum, thanks for joining us today. These couple of women have certainly been inspiring in sharing their journeys with us. Don't forget, if you can possibly um, donate to our Pink Ribbon Mums at the Table um, page and our, that is now on the bottom of the screen, that would be great because we know that with the research that's going on, that's why a lot of women are doing so well today. And finally, also, if you're a mum and you'd like to join our Facebook group, please feel free to do that. We love to have you join us. We're a great community of like-minded mums that are there to support each other and be that village that a lot of mums don't have. So thanks for joining um, our Facebook Live today and we'll see you again in the next one. Bye for now.